Um, welcome. This is the fourth of our ARG UK autumn seminar series, which was set up to replace our regional meetings given the restrictions of COVID. Um, tonight, we're going to focus on district level licensing and John Cranfield uh, from Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Amphibian and Reptile Group and Herpetologic is going to be our master of ceremonies. So I'm going to I'm going to try and start bang on time, which is in about 30 seconds. So just to say welcome and over to John. Well, hi, everyone. I have the groups. Uh, we have one R group and three consultants tonight that are going to be talking about their experiences of district level licensing. Um, it's very much weighted towards the natural England um, natural England led schemes. Um, there are quite a number now that have been launched and new ones are being launched all the time. Um, but we're hoping to focus in on um, an ARGS perspective on the process and then um, perspectives from consultants who, who have actually been uh, using the system. Um, and I hope to um, hear, from, uh, hear from Mike in a moment. Um, Mike Phillips and Kent Reptile Amphibian Group. Um, I have uh, the timer here. Um, we do have uh, 139 people, and I believe we do have Natural England um, on the call. Um, the program is presentations at first. Uh, we also have a number of polls and questions for our participants through the webinar, um, and then we'll hopefully have. Um, about 30 minutes of discussion at the end. Um, I'm uh, a newt ecologist. I've been working for 20 years or so as a specialist ecological consultant. So I have a, a reasonable idea of newt mitigation. Um, and uh, I've also um, have myself um, been involved in the district level licensing process as a volunteer at hurt workers meetings all the way through to trying to uh, convince clients that it was it's a good idea to um, um, to inquire and join uh, a scheme over to you Mike right thank you very much John and thank you to Arg UK for inviting Craig to speak tonight um, my thought will be 10 minutes maximum um, and hopefully it will provide the story of, of Craig's involvement with district level licensing and will provide a little bit of an introduction for some of you who may not be familiar with it, but by the looks of the last poll result, most of you are ecological consultants, so most of you will be very familiar with district level licensing. Well, this is Craig's involvement, which started in 2016 um, and ended in 2019. Okay, so the, the reptile and amphibian group um, are one of many groups that are that are sheltering under the umbrella of ARG UK um, and primarily we're a recording group um, but one of our aims also includes uh, conservation and so when we heard about district level licensing we thought well we probably have a responsibility um, to our members uh, and we are a membership organization we have uh, close to 200 members um, we have a responsibility to get involved. So when we heard that there was a pilot district level licensing um, project being launched in Kent, we thought we'd better engage. And this is actually what it's all about. And with all the politics and everything else that might be involved, sometimes it's, it's, you can actually forget that all of this is, about, is actually about nudes. And really the reason that Craig got involved and the reason it wanted to become involved was because we thought this was an opportunity not just to stand up for, for news, but we felt that district level licensing was an opportunity to make things better for news. And that's essentially why we got involved. So was there room for improvement in the first place? Um, the site-based mitigation for, for great crested newts. Um, I think it's probably fair to say most people would say that there were mixed results. Sometimes there are some very good examples of site-based mitigation for great crested newts, but the, the PhD that Brett Lewis um, did a few years back kind of confirmed what most of us thought, that there were 
areas for improvement. So whilst there were some good projects, there were some that were not so great and there were some that were pretty awful. Um, and actually we didn't have a huge amount of confidence that Habitat Created would be retained into the long term. Um, and there's a lot of people claiming and saying that actually wouldn't it be better to spend more money on habitat creation and less money on consultants looking for and moving new. So it's important to point out at the beginning that Crag are not fundamentally opposed to district level licensing. We, we, we went into this with an open mind. We felt that there was genuine opportunities uh, to, to make things better. So our first contact from, from Natural England um, was in 2016 in those heady days before the Brexit referendum um, when we thought there was no threat to the status of, uh, of, of great crested newts as European protected species. Um, and the first meeting we attended was in Ashford. Uh, it was actually organised by uh, the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust. Um, and that was uh, our introduction to how the process was likely to work in, in Kent. And we then met Rob Cameron, who was heading up um, things for, for Natural England at those, in those days uh, in July 2016 uh, which was after the referendum uh, result and obviously things had changed and then we were left under we were left in no under no illusions that it was either district level licensing or, or nothing um, but it was a positive meeting Natural England were keen to, to access the data that, that Craig had um, but it was at this point that, that we were told actually this could lead to a great crested new conservation strategy for Kent and for an organisation that was interested in, in the, the conservation status of, of newts in Kent having a strategy sounded like a really appealing thing and we were actually quite positive about how things might develop. Um, so, so these initial conversations were a a way to you know to, for us to understand what impact district level licensing might have and we were told you know we would actually be finally defining favorable conservation status for great crested newts we'd have an understanding of the metrics behind that favorable conservation status and that would be the underpinning knowledge or the underpinning science that for a conservation strategy um, for great crested newts in Kent with targets uh, for both the range uh, and the number of ponds and, and the, the quality of the habitat. So we felt this was very positive. This is something we really wanted to be involved in. And there was an opportunity to, to get involved in, in strategy meetings. We were told we could either be stakeholders or, or we could be um, on a sounding board. And we, we chose to join the, the sounding board. But by, t by um, early 2017, we were asked to, to provide data for the project so that they could model uh, populations and, and this was a tricky thing for Crag to approach because whilst we have a large database there is a large database in Kent Crag um, doesn't own all of the data uh, within that database and because this was potentially um, a controversial project we talked to people about whether they wanted us to, to share their data so everybody who has data on the database was asked whether they wanted to share it. Eventually we did, we set up a data sharing agreement with Natural England um, that said that they couldn't pass it on to third parties and it was for a limited time period only. Things went on, we had meetings in London, there was good initial progress. Um, there was a draft conservation strategy uh, released um, and, you know, and, and we, we found out what favorable conservation status might look at in looking Kent we were you know this was September 2017 we were quite impressed with what was going on this this was something that we could definitely work with um, there was even a draft conservation strategy for crested newts in the county of Kent and Medway and these were these were things that we thought definitely it's worth getting involved um, but at some point something changed and from a from a situation where we felt the emphasis was definitely on the conservation of newts suddenly it seemed that that i, I, I don't know what it was i can't comment but I, but potentially you know there was pressure being put on people to get this district level licensing out um from above and and the first issues came when the risk zones were, were first shown to us um which are here and the only red zones so these are the, the zones where you couldn't um 
news licensing were were triple SIs where there was unlikely to be much in the way of um, uh, development anyway. So um, Lee Brady produced a map of what he thought the priority areas were, um, which was markedly different with the red areas predominantly in the low wield and the high wield. Um, and this is the, the map that I took off uh, the, the Natural England website a couple of days ago. And this shows um, you know, where the priority, area, where the, the risk areas were. And so the amber areas are the, are the areas where there's likely to be development. Um, and there are some issues that we pointed out in 2017, but are, are still here with us today. These blue dots are the Crested Newt records. And there are areas around the River Dower and at the end of the River Stour, which are high risk area or medium risk areas, um, but there's no newts, no crested newts there at all. And these were issues that were picked up. And, and again, if you start looking at the maps in detail, we started to worry a little bit about what was happening. And, and things kind of got a bit worse um, as, as time went on. There was a lack of response to questions that we, we put to, to the Natural England team. Um, the, the minimum pond size for uh, habitat created was only 100 square metres uh, and the nature of the, of the contract for the, the organisations that were creating those ponds didn't give them any incentive to, to make ponds that were larger than that. Um, Natural England declared that they could no longer keep to the data sharing agreement and couldn't promise that they wouldn't pass data on to third parties. Um, and the final nail in the coffin for, for Crag was the, the removal of the Great Crested Newt Conservation Strategy, which was one of the reasons why we engaged in the first place. And we were told at this point, will we not be progressing with completion of the strategy until such time that we can secure the funding needed to resource the work? And we were told that um, developers wouldn't stomach it uh, and that perhaps Crag might want to create its own Crested new strategy for Kent. So that was fair to say was, was fairly disappointing. Um, eventually the scheme launched, Crag issued a, a position statement um, and that was where we left uh, the process and, and no longer engaged with, with district level licensing. And I suppose how I'd like to finish off would be to say, well, some of the questions we had right at the beginning of the process, we still have now in, in 2020. And so how is the success of, of district level licensing being measured? What assessment is being made of, of lost great crested new populations? How is conservation status being measured? And is there any strategy for achieving favourable conservation status? These things may be in process. We, we've crag withdrew and then started focusing our efforts again on, on recording. Um, and I mean, but I have heard people saying that, that actually it's useful to have district level licensing as one of the tools in a toolkit. What I, my fear is now that it will end up being the only tool in the toolkit. And hopefully we won't lose sight of the, the, the newts through the whole of this and, and um... Thanks very much, Mike. Is that the end? That is the end. Sorry, I lost my thread. Just finally at the end, but, but thank you uh, for listening and, and uh, thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely some concerns there. Um, perhaps Natural England can um, provide a few more details on that if we send those questions to them. So um, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, I will hand it over to Donna now, uh, who is consultant in Kent and her experience of um, uh, a district level license scheme. Hand it over to you, Donna. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Sorry, Thank just uh, in the hang of my screens. Hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, so thank you very much, John. Um, I'm just going to check my timing, make sure I try and keep on track into my 10 minutes. So yeah, um, to introduce myself, I'm Donna Popwell. I'm a director um, and co-owner of uh, Bakerwell with Fiona Baker, who you can see on our slide. So really my talk was more directed towards sharing the practitioner's experience of trialing and taking forward the uh, Natural England district level license on what we consider to be a relatively 
relatively low risk site for Great Christian Newts in Kent. And so I've just illustrated uh, the timeline of our involvement really with the project, uh, ranging from first attending the consultant, one of the consultant project meetings in March 2017, through to when we test, tested our case, submitted a test case with Natural England in February, and then uh, finally received a granted district level license in May of last year. So to talk about our site, our site is uh, two parcels, uh, which were for residential, residential development, uh, approximately 168 units. And our site was really located within a much larger mixed use multi-phase development. Our site is about 6.9 hectares. Um, and essentially there is existing residential development to the north. And then within our site, which wraps around that development, there was or is a hedge, grass and dry ditch to the north boundary between the residential development and then the arable habitat, which comprised pretty much the rest of our parcels. And in the wider uh, landscape, really that was, again, uh, mainly arable habitat with uh, little pockets of uh, woodland and uh, hedgerows. So the, there were no ponds on our site. Um, there were nine ponds within 250 metres and great crested newts were present in six of these ponds. Three of those ponds were actually quite close to our site boundary within about 50 to 100 metres. And over the years of surveys that were undertaken for the um, outline planning and for the uh, full planning for the site, a uh, medium to large Great Crested New population was recorded. Um, it's also important for me to note at this point that the hedge, uh, grass and dry ditch boundary to the site, that actually performed what we considered to be quite an important ecological corridor, which allowed some of the great crested newts potentially to move between some of the ponds off site um, and to disperse between ponds at times. That, that boundary also formed habitat for other protected species such as reptiles. So in terms of our, um, this sort of bit more about the site, the, the wider mixed use development had actually had a number of European protected species mitigation licenses granted. And as part of one of those licenses, herptile fencing had actually already been installed to the Northern boundary. And that essentially separated the arable part of our parcel um, from the uh, hedge grass dry ditch boundary and stopped gray crested newts from being able to actually come into the construction boundary. Because the site was actually designed for a traditional, license, a traditional licensing process, we had already designed in um, a focus on retaining, protecting and enhancing that very key ecological corridor, but also providing new routes for Great Crested Newts to be able to move through our um, development and um, through the use of uh, wildflower, species-rich wildflower meadow planting and uh, species-rich hedgerow planting. And they performed two ecological corridors that would then allow the newts in the off-site residential area to move through our site and to colonise new habitats in the wider uh, mixed-use development that would be created in the longer term. So, we looked at the potential benefits that district level licensing could provide for our site. And essentially this would form the ability to not have to do a translocation or to install any additional herptile fencing. The client wouldn't have to do post-development monitoring. And so that would resolve in, uh, result in a level of uh, time saving and potential cost saving for our clients, as well as creating a new habitat in the best locations for great crested use, which is the, the purpose of district level licensing. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to trial the new approach in an area where we knew there were quite a few great crystal new ponds nearby with potentially high populations, um, but on a site where there was actually relatively um, low quality habitat for great crystal newts and therefore a low risk of a significant impact to the local great crystal newt population. And that was important to us because at that time district level licensing was very, very new and relatively untested. So in terms of constraints for the district level licensing approach, the fact that we've got reptiles on site and the fact that we have previous licenses granted and the herptile fencing installed under that licensing meant that actually the herptile fencing would have to stay in situ and therefore, whereas normally perhaps there wouldn't be those reptile fencing maintenance costs associated with traditional licensing, that would still continue on this particular site. So really we knew that the district level license in this scenario would pose a relatively low risk to the local great crested newt population, but equally the full benefits of district level licensing wouldn't be realised. 
So we took the trial through the inquiry process. Um, that was really a very simplified application process, um, a short application form and some GIS fi files just demonstrating the site boundary, where the ponds were, whether they had great crystal use at present, absent, or they hadn't been surveyed. And there was a process of uh, liaison between ourselves and Natural England. Natural England's impact assessment, which is the outcome, output of the inquiry, uh, essentially confirmed that although no ponds will be lost on, on site, 1.5 ponds would be functionally lost. And because we have a compensation ratio based on the survey data that was present, so it had already been collected, this resulted in a total of 5.83 compensatory ponds required and a cost at £87,000. So quite, quite a significant cost. For us, uh, discussion with our client was very key throughout this process. We obviously discussed this with them before actually submitting the test case. And once we had the cost back from Natural England, we uh, delivered a cost benefit analysis for the client. And essentially, this just demonstrated that the traditional licensing costs were significantly lower than the district level licensing costs on this particular site. Um, regardless of that, at the um, and actually it's worth me noting at this point that the um, Natural England back, came back to us this year and actually lowered that conservation fee mainly because they'd made an adjustment in the methodology and the way they apply the level of risk to ponds off site that are lost and so we had a subsequent refund and that cost was reduced to £63,000 but this is still significantly higher than the, the cost of traditional licensing on our site. The client would like wanted us to proceed regardless, essentially due to the time saving. And that was quite important for us to understand that actually it's ultimately the client's decision on this and we can't make any assumptions despite the fact that the cost may look very high to us. So the application process was then submitted. Um, that was a very, again, a very simplified process with the application form, a reason statement and the GIS files that I mentioned before. The license was granted and essentially the license remains valid for two years and as a large proportion of you will probably know this essentially covers the killing and injury of grey crested news and the damage and destruction of resting and breeding places. The license also includes within the guidance some reasonable avoidance measures. And this, these are not mandatory, um, but they're detailed in the license and they clarify where supervision would be required or they would need to be undertaken by a licensed ecologist. We discussed these measures with our client and actually they were very happy to take forward some additional measures on our recommendation. So in terms of implementing the license, uh, we had a number of queries that uh, Natural England were very quick in coming back to respond to actually. And we gave a toolbox talk and some training to a previously identified site man manager who um, ha was happy to act as a biodiversity champion for the site. So we gave them some training, gave them some training on handling, on the ecology, legislation, welfare, where to relocate any great crystal meets if they found them and welfare issues. We also carried out a destructive search on an area of particular concern. I have to say working with the biodiversity manager was a, was a really good the champion was a really good experience he was really engaged and he asked us to provide some additional information to him that could be incorporated into their site induction and then disseminated to all staff on their site regardless of whether they were effectively involved in licensable activities so i think for us, uh, this obviously was what was very early stage um, in terms of district level licensing. Some of the key learning outcomes we received were that um, the type of habitat on site is not really taken into consideration in the district level licensing process. Um, so whether you have high quality core terrestrial habitat or arable habitat, that really there's no distinction made as part of district level licensing. We now include district level licensing quite often as an option in our reports. So to make the process a little bit easier for our clients if they decided to take up district level licensing post planning. But as with our site, district level licensing costs may well exceed traditional costs. For example, where there are lots of great crystal new ponds present and close to site and other protected species on site. Even then, it can still result in some significant time savings. And as we said, as I mentioned earlier, client communication is a key. And it's quite important to remember the responses from clients and their willingness to, to have an uptake RAMs may vary according to their priorities. Essentially, we found that sites with no other protected species, no surveys undertaken, a low number of ponds, some distance from site, um, or where they've missed the key survey window is likely to provide the highest cost savings for developers whilst delivering those essential new habitats for the conservation of key GCM populations. 
but we would apply some caution to sites where there are large great crested newt populations and the development is likely to result in a loss of high quality core or connective habitat on site. So really for us, um, the key point is that we would consider district level licensing on a, on a case by case basis. Um, and yes, we, we would consider it to be a valuable addition to the toolkit, but an addition rather than a replacement. Thank you, John. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for asking me to talk. Thanks very much, Donna. Um, interesting, um, sort of becoming a, a, a tool open to consultants. Um, that's, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to, to Luke Gorman from Atkins. Uh, I believe he's going to be talking uh, about his experiences uh, up in Cheshire. Is that right, Luke? Yes, yes, that's right, John. Thanks very so, much. Um, and I understand you have some other, an update from Natural England as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, John. Thanks very much. Uh, Take care. Thanks very much, Donna and Mike, um, for sharing your experiences with the LL licensing as well. That was a, it was very interesting to hear both your accounts of that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Luke Goldman from Atkins. I'm an ecologist for Atkins. I've worked with them for 16 years now. Um, and I'm going to share my experience of Natural England's district level licensing scheme for a site called Basford East in Cheshire. So Basford East um, license, BLL licensing scheme, it was the uh, sixth license that was issued in Cheshire and it was the 18th DLL license issued nationally. In Cheshire, there's been 11 DLL licenses issued up until the end of September 2020. And I can't actually see my screen because everyone's in the way. Let me delete all these little videos. And there's a further 19 DLL licenses expected to be issued in Cheshire once the planning permissions have been obtained for those licenses. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about why we needed a DLL license at Basford East. Uh, the scheme was a primary infrastructure scheme. We were putting in two spine roads, a crossing over Basford Brook, and we we're installing new drainage. And this infrastructure was both new residential, commercial, and employment phases at the site. The impact and the reason we need a license was we will be disrupting Great Crescent New Terrestrial Habitats. We didn't have any up-to-date surveys for the ponds and meters. Um, the survey data was over four years old, just but we did have historic records and a lot of desktop records uh, for Great Crest News in that area. So the, fir the first part of being involved in the DLL scheme is you, you've got to fill in an inquiry form and send that to Natural England. Now Atkins weren't involved at this point. We actually took over this, this scheme later on. So a previous consultancy filled in the inquiry form and that was back in April, 2019. That inquiry form went off to Natural England and Natural England then assessed the impact to Great Crescent Newts and they calculate the conservation payment that you will need to make to join the DLL scheme. Now for this particular scheme, the number of ponds within 250 metres of the site was only four. Actually, none of those ponds were going to be lost. They were all off-site ponds. But Natural England does make a calculation to take into account proportionate impacts for off-site ponds. Um, and they actually calculated that the loss of ponds will be 0.2. So that's just the proportionate impacts they calculated. Now, because our site was in an amber zone, you actually have to add a compensation multiplier to the ponds. And for amber, that's two. So Natural England estimated we'd be losing 0.2 ponds, times that by two, and that's the amount of compensation ponds that you're required to pay for. So that came to 0.4. We then have to apply a time lag multiplier of 1.1, and that's because the ponds are less than one year old. So that takes the number of ponds to 0.44. So that, that was the number of, that was the amount of pond we had to uh, compensate for, 0.44 of a pond. Um, and that payment was, uh, was, was needed to be made to Natural England so we could join the scheme. 
So once we got the impact assessment and conservation payment certificate back from Natural England, uh, Atkins signed it, we sent it back to Natural England, they can't sign it very quickly in less than a week. In fact, I think it was in a couple of days and that was back with us. Then all we had to do really was wait for our planning permission. We got our planning permission in November 2019. Now we're pretty much ready to apply for the license. Um, we had our planning permission and we had most of the documents we needed. So we had our application form, the can signed impact assessment and conservation payment certificate, our reason statement and our planning permission. However, we were missing um, an EA environmental permit and a land drainage consent form, which we didn't have at that point. It's worth mentioning also for DLL licenses, you don't actually have to submit a MEF statement. So at that point, we actually put in our application despite missing two of the forms we needed. And Natural England put in an invoice for the, for the amount we owed for compensation. We, we paid that instantly. And then it was just a waiting game, really. For the environmental permit, the land drainage content form that we were missing. So we eventually, in, in May 2020, we got the two permits and consents that we were waiting for. And we sent this Natural England and the license was actually granted that very same day. Uh, I mean, I've got to say, throughout this whole process, Natural England were absolutely fantastic. The engagement and the guidance throughout, which was quite a new process for me, this was my first license, but was really superb, and I, I just can't fault it. So one, once I got this license, the license permits acts that obviously you would never normally be able to uh, undertake, including killing, injuring, disturbing, capturing, transporting GCM, as well as damage and destruction of their breeding sites and resting places. Now, under the DLL scheme, you don't actually have to put any avoidance measures in place for news. Um, it's, it's really down to the discretion of the ecologist. So this is where we're up to at the moment. We're working on the site. I've got to say, the ecological course is working on the site nearly every week because we do have other protected species at the site also. So we need, we need to have someone there. And despite having the DLL license, we are undertaking reasonable avoidance measures for Great Britain. We are undertaking hand searches of suitable habitat, checking that any newts are there. And if they are, if they are there, the license does actually allow us to move those newts out of harm's way. So far, we've just found common, common frogs and we have moved them out of homes where we've not found any great crescent new pairs yet. But it's still relatively early days and there's still chance to find them. And if we do, we will be moving those. So these are my thoughts on the process. For this particular site, the DLL license works very well. It, it's, it's effective. We've been, we're able to move newts if we find them, not that we have so far. And the cost is really minimal. I mean, the cost for this license is not much different to the cost of resurveying all the ponds within 250 meters. And it's certainly a lot cheaper than undertaking update surveys and then going down the standard licensing route. So the client was happy, we were happy, and the works could go ahead without many delays. We we're also avoidance measures. So we're, we're doing our best to minimise any impacts to great crested newts at that site. However, the use of DLL really should be carefully considered on a side-by-side -side basis. It works well for this and it is working well for this site, but we don't have so many ponds within 250 metres. There's no ponds been lost, so the cost is cheap, the impact to newts is, is pretty low, and on some other sites, if you, if you start getting ponds within your site that you're going to be losing, your costs are going to multiply quite rapidly. So it might not be the most appropriate way forward. And it really, you really need to weigh the pros and cons of a standard license and a DLL license on each site. So these are some figures that the heart of the press really, the flow up until the end of September 2020, so till the end of quarter two, Natural England sent these to me last week. And they're just of interest really, because it shows 
just in the National England led DLL scheme, I should say, um, the number of licenses that have been issued from the launch of the National England DLL to the end of quarter two, so to the end of September 2020. The number of licenses nationally that have been issued are 34, and the number of licenses that have been issued in Cheshire are, is 11. And you can see how much income has uh, been received so far during the scheme um, on a national level and in Cheshire, and how much income is still expected through the scheme. And th th these figures are also interesting because it, it shows you how many ponds have actually been either created or restored under the National England led DLL scheme. So, nationally, there's been 343 ponds either created or restored, and actually only 16.6 .6 lost. And in Cheshire, there's been 109 pond, ponds that have been either created or restored, and at the moment, only 6.6 .6 lost. So as you can see, there's a, there's a lot more ponds going in than the ponds that have been lost. And actually, the ponds that have been lost, some of them are off-site ponds that aren't technically lost. So the useful, the useful figures to look at, it does show that more ponds are going in. Um, there's a preference for creating ponds rather than restoring them, but it, it depends on the region and, and what's the, the best for that area. But in Cheshire, there's, there's, a, there's a large focus on creation rather than restoration. So yeah, that, that's my experience of DLL. Like I say, just, just the one scheme, it's a relatively small scheme. Uh, so I hope that's been useful. And uh, hopefully the, the figures have been useful for you to see how the National England-led DLL scheme is, is working so far. Thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me to speak. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think we will um, ha hand over to Tilly. Um, there's some questions for you later, Luke, um, in the Q&A after that one. So I'll hand over Tilly, to Tilly now, Tilly Tilbrook, um, about her experiences, I think, in Wiltshire and Gloucestershire. Hi there, John. Thanks very much for that. Um, so I'm a chartered ecologist. I've been working in the industry for about 17 years now and set up Integrated Ecological Solutions about 11 years ago. And we've been involved in two district level licensing schemes so far. Um, so what I'm just going to talk to you about is the two projects that we've covered um, so far. They've been really very different projects. Uh, there has been a large variation in the conservation payments that have resulted from these. Um, and I'm going to just give you an overview of the process and what conclusions we can draw from these two um, projects that are really at the opposite ends of quite a big spectrum when it comes to district level licensing. So project one was a very small scale project. It was going to result in temporary impacts on terrestrial habitat from reprofiling a bank um, of a pond uh, in order to put in a new road link. Now, we went out to this pond quite late in the day um, earlier on this year when the client suddenly said, oh, we're putting this road in and could you just check? Uh, we're a bit worried about newts. So I went out and did a habitat suitability index, which came back as incredibly poor. In fact, it came back as 0.002. Um, so that didn't bode well for there being any newts there. It was a very new balancing pond. There was no vegetation in it. It didn't look great at all. But we did an eDNA test on it and it came back positive for great crested newts. Now, it was just inside one of the Natural England district level licensing areas and one of the new areas that's come on this year. And because the project work was critical and it was a critical infrastructure project, any delays involved in licensing were really pretty unacceptable on this site. So we put in the application form for them to consider the impact assessment uh, for district level licensing. And the way this came back was that we knew there were no ponds within the site boundary and we knew there was only one pond within the 250 metre buffer. 
So the impact assessment came back as 0.1 ponds being lost with the risk assessment and that a 1.1 time lag multiplier was again required as Luke was discussing because the compensation ponds had been in for less than a year which took us to 0.11 ponds required. Now I can't give you the exact conservation payment um, but it was so much lower than any kind of trap and translocate or even habitat manipulation work would have been. Um, it was really you know really very cheap indeed. Um, but we hit a bit of a snag which was that I had a phone call from Natural England where they said we've assessed your payment um, it's all fine your district level license is fine this all seems very appropriate but we don't have any ponds for you we've got no compensation ponds in place the partner that's putting them in hasn't put them in and I went back to them and I said well that's all very well and good but we can't put in 0.11 ponds anyway and given that this is only temporary habitat loss um, is there a way that we can go around this because this is a pretty critical infrastructure project and we're not losing any um, any ponds on site we're going to actually create more terrestrial habitat at the end than we've started so I'd like us to try and find a solution and so I waited a few days and Natural England came back and said someone hasn't updated a spreadsheet and it turns out there is a pond. So that was a great outcome for everybody. Um, and that is in the process at the moment of going through and the impact on newts is going to be incredibly low in that area. So that then takes us to project number two. Now this is a large scale project. It's a housing development of about 350 houses and it is adjacent to a site which had great crested newts on it that were translocated um, and the reason that I know exactly how many were translocated is that I translocated them on the adjacent site under a, a normal traditional license. Now as part of that traditional license we created five new ponds on the adjacent land and because I knew that this housing development was potentially coming forward on the adjacent land, I designed the mitigation so that it ran alongside the boundary of the housing development and could just simply be mirrored on the other side. So on the first project, we had um, five new ponds created on adjacent land that were colonised by great crested newts within six months. And they were within a five metre buffer strip for newts that had a high vernacular associated with each pond. And the idea was that this was all created, it would be in place um, and it would have established itself well. And then when the housing development came along, we could create a five metre buffer on the other side and we would effectively have a 10 metre wide habitat corridor for newts with new ponds in it already when this housing development came along. Um, so we then looked at the housing development site and we were looking at a permanent loss of very poor quality because it was incredibly heavily overgrazed but it was core terrestrial habitat for newts and the timing of the planning permission that we were looking at meant that if we went down the traditional licensing route we would be looking at a delay of nearly a year um, by the time we'd got a license and then done a trap and translocate on that site which as you can imagine would be really costly so the impact assessment came back from Natural England. <clears throat> there were no ponds within the site boundary because I designed the development layout so that they didn't affect any of the ponds directly. But we did have 16 ponds within 250 metres of the site boundary and some of them were very close as in they were the five new ponds that were adjacent. Um, and they were all surveyed or eDNA tested so we knew the status of newts there. The impact assessment from Natural England was that equated to 1.7 ponds lost but because of the risk assessment that came to five compensation ponds required and because this is a new district level licensing area all the compensation ponds had been in for less than a year so again we had the 1.1 multiplier so we got to five and a half compensation ponds required. Now, I can't give you the compensation, the conservation payment because it's confidential, but a traditional license would probably have been three to four times cheaper than going down this route, but it would have caused a delay of a, you know, a year at least. And given the number of newts on the site, the client decided to pay. So that went down the district level licensing route. They're just waiting for planning permission at the moment. So what conclusions have we drawn from being, going through these two projects? 
Firstly, the application process is much quicker and easier than a traditional license and Natural England are incredibly engaged and will talk to you. You can have a sensible conversation with them about it and you can resolve problems much more easily than via a traditional license. The other thing that's really good is it provides the client with real certainty as to the costs. So you have none of these issues where, for example, the cost of fencing went up massively when COVID started because they were having to put the fencing in um, socially distanced. So you've got real certainty as to what the costs are going to be on your site. It really streamlined the planning process because you just submit your countersigned conservation certificate with your planning application and it gives confidence to the local planning authority that you will get a license. On the other hand, the reasonable avoidance measures are up to the client and they are not enforced in any way and whilst we can provide them with advice, at the end of the day they do not have to follow any of them and in fact one of our clients asked us to get it in writing from Natural England that they didn't need to do anything else with regards to newts and Natural England provided that. And whether that should be up to the client or not is a matter for debate I would say. Also, at the moment, the payment calculation isn't really transparent enough to allow a pre-application cost assessment in these new areas. A lot of the um, red, amber, green risk assessment maps aren't on the Natural England GIS site to download at the moment, especially for the new areas. And so it's not possible to do these calculations. And I've been asked for them by clients and we can't do them. So is it always the best option? very much depends on your client, how they can deal with delays and what the actual overall costs are going to be. But what we're finding is that clients are willing to pay the sort of fairly low ass um, assessment cost in order to find out what the total cost will be and then make a decision from there. So it's really, that's something you need to discuss with your clients. Thanks very much, John. Thanks, Tilly, the level of experience. Um, we've got a number of questions. We're going to move on to the Q&A. Um, it's uh, interesting to hear people's experiences of uh, district level licensing. Um, I think we've got Natural England can answer some of these as well if we get to them. Uh, so there's a question for Donna. Um, Donna, do you know where the compensation ponds for your application were eventually created? Uh, no, is the answer to that, actually. And it's a good question that I will follow up. <laughs> OK, um, because that's generally what happens, isn't it? It's sort of pay the money and you, you don't actually need to do anything um, on site. So uh, what else have we got? Luke, there's a question here for you. Um, why was DLL applied at the Cheshire site rather than reliance on the relevant any new policies? Right, yes, yeah, someone else Barrow. asked that question and I have time to respond. Um, so we, we weren't the consultants involved at that point, but I believe the new licensing policies and also the use of a liquor licence were, were both considered for the, the cost benefits of going down the uh, DLL route were, was, well, it was cheaper basically and the impact to Noose was deemed to be very low for that site, so DLL was the chosen route. Okay. Um, Tilly, what, what about you? Um, similar sort of question, really. The new, yeah, the EPS policies, were they not applicable in your case, one of your cases? Um, so they wouldn't have been applicable, I don't think, on either of our sites. Um, the big site especially, they wouldn't really have been applicable because there was just, you know, the, the news are very definitely there um, and moving across the site. And really what the DLL does is it just provides that level of certainty to the clients, which I think they really liked. So I think that was why we chose to go down that route. Okay. Cool. Uh, it says here, uh, how do we consolidate the fact that pond ecology does not begin and end with great crested newts? Whilst there are failings with site-based habitat creation, the creation of habitat near that which exists currently would also help to mitigate some of the loss of other species which may not be present, present at the DLL habitat creation sites and therefore would technically result in an overall reduction in biodiversity. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? Other than amphibians and reptiles? 
other than amphibians and reptiles. Um, yeah, I think it did. I, I guess we, we're not really talking about biodiversity net gain here, are we? And um, and if we are, you know, the, the creating um, new ponds off-site is an issue uh, in terms of the local conservation status of newts. Um, I mean, I'm not aware, I mean, looking at some of the ponds that we know have been created in Kent um, through district level licensing, they have been created on a, in a fairly narrow strip uh, along the, the clay in Kent. And so projects that are outside of that area, there will be a, a loss of ponds uh, within uh, within those development sites that where there aren't new ponds being created. And there, it obviously it does run the risk of, of impacting, you know, other 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 species where traditional methods wouldn't have done that. And so there's some questions here which uh, Natural England will like to answer. Um, we've got here, does Natural England use the money to do work around the developments where DLL are issued? Um, I, I guess that's work on, on sites rather. Jen or Ben or Annabelle, can you hear us? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Everyone Great, else? okay. Yeah, no, the, um, the, the income to, to DLL schemes is 85% of that goes directly towards habitat creation or restoration, monitoring and management of that, of that new pond habitat. And that's all off site, so it's not on site. Um, I have another question actually. Uh, how frequently is the Kent risk map, but the risk map expected to be reviewed uh, by anonymous and attendee? Jen. Okay. Um, I don't know. Ben's, Ben's connection is, is coming in and out. Um, Annabelle, I mean, we, we, are, we review that um, the the, the maps for every two years. So that's the term of the, um, of the district level licensing scheme. And we will do that um, on, a, on a biannual basis. But what we are doing underneath that is keeping our living pond layer up to date. So that's tracking pond losses to development and um, pond gains through compensation habitat offsite. And that is a sort of a very live picture, if you like, of uh, pond losses and gains across the landscape. Okay, um, we have a question for Donna, um, Neil Madden. Uh, my experience with linear developments is that DNL can be much more expensive, but I understand this has been addressed. Donna, you mentioned the rebate your client received due to the change on how any implement conservation payments for offsite ponds. Um, well, I mean, this is actually to Natural England as well, but yeah. <laughs> um, can anyone explain these changes? Um, Donna, was there any explanation of why that was changed, the rebate? It was more really related to the, how the risk factor was applied to off-site ponds. But that's really as much as I know about that, as much detail as I was given. I can come in there if you would like me to, John. Yeah, that's fine, Jen. Thank you. Um, so we, um, we did look at how we calculate the impact for small developments because they were uh, proportionately um, affected in that first year of the scheme in Kent and Cheshire. And, um, and there were four customers that, were, um, that, that needed a partial refund as a consequence of, of making that, um, that review. Um, in terms of, of linear schemes, um, uh, whoever asked the question, you're absolutely right. There is a, um, a disproportionate um, impact and it's, um, it's, a, it's a factor of um, a, large, a large red line boundary compared to a small volume within it. Um, and we, we are interested in thinking about how we look at linear schemes in a more proportionate way, um, but we want to do that carefully and, and do that with some, with, with some test cases, which, we've, which we are doing. Working uh, process progress. Uh, also, there's a question here uh, for Nat, for yourself again, uh, Jen. Uh, why are any rolling out DLL in areas where they do not have sufficient level of conservation ponds created, restored, to provide for new DLL applications? Um, I have inquired in in Essex, and the site wasn't serviceable. Um, how how could that be remedied in the future? 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, in the in the first year of the scheme, we just um, we had just the Kent and Cheshire schemes running. They were they were characterised quite differently. So in Kent, smaller, more numerous applications that we were generally able to keep keep ahead of in terms of um, habitat supply. In contrast, in Cheshire was uh, was characterised by fewer but much larger developments, sort of taking quite a sort of substantial chunk each time out of um, out of our pond bank, the, um, the, com the, num the compensation ponds that we've got to allocate to development. So in that first year, it was quite difficult to, um, to really predict accurately um, how many developers and uh, consultants will be interested in using district level licensing and what the and what the demand yeah what that demand might be how it might change over the course of the year and so on um, i think in this this year with the launch of the um of the further six schemes in february and march of which swindon and wiltshire was one um I, again we we had um we we had a pond bank um, ahead of launch um, but where we've got some big developments coming in and, um, and, and using up that supply, we've, we've needed to get better at, um, at staying ahead of demand. And I'm, I'm confident that we're doing that in more places more of the time going forward. But um, in a way, um, I think that, that shows that um, you know, the, the checks and balances which are in place, we're not going to um, um, accept a development that we can't we can't service that we don't have the habitat um, in the ground at the right in the right condition for, for GCN. Uh, so Tilly, um, you want to jump in on that as well? Yeah. So the other thing to be aware of is that um, in case people don't know, the way Natural England work it with the ponds is that there are the compensation ponds that apply to your development and then there are what are called the backup ponds so although um, you may have your five compensation ponds they're also putting in the backup ponds as well in case your ponds fail and the way they're working it is they're taking the backup ponds as their kind of pool for want of a better word of ponds to draw from from the next development and so it basically as more developments come forward more ponds become available for future developments but when you're at a very early stage in a scheme um, they have no way of knowing exactly how many are going to come forward and therefore um, how many to put in in advance and I don't think that we can say that it's problematic that they're bringing it forward and rolling it out when the ponds aren't created because they have no way of knowing how many they're going to need and so they just need enough to get the ball rolling to build up that bank of backup ponds that can then be allocated to the next development and um, I think where it becomes problematic is in situations like mine where we had like you know, not even half a pond that was needed as compensation um, there, I think a degree of nuance needs to be applied to the situation. Okay, uh, I've got quite a few questions now. Um, so who actually, yeah, I think it's for Jen again, uh, who actually creates the compensation ponds? What standards are they created to and how long are they monitored for? Um, so so we work with, with a number of, of bodies um, the, the, the typical ones in any area are, are the Wildlife Trust, the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Groups, and sometimes the local planning um, authorities have, have their own land holdings on, on which they're, they're interested in creating or restoring um, ponds for, for the district level licensing scheme. So we're working with about 17 partners of, um, of, that cover those three broad categories at the moment, and, and they're the ones that, that deliver, deliver habitat. Um, what we're interested in is trying to build up that relationship with them so that they can build up the relationship with the landowners that we're, they're working with on the ground around the compensation ponds. So that long term relationship over and monitoring and, and maintaining that pond to be suitable for GCN um, over 25 years, that, that, um, that relationship building part is, is critical. So. Um, we're investing in those in those partners for the for the long term and and trying to give them more sort of surety over over their income through this route um, going forward. So that comes back to the the supply and demand that um, that we alluded to earlier. Um, and it says here, how does the nature space scheme compare with the NE led schemes? Um, I suppose is that another question for you, Jen, or anyone else in Natural England? It's um... 
Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can answer, I can provide a view on that. So um, yeah, there are three delivery models for district level licensing and operation, as well as the natural England led schemes. There's the nature space ones that are um, operating um, in the South Midlands. And then LPAs are holding their own organizational license and operating a scheme. Um, and that includes Woking, Telford and Rekin and, um, and, and shortly Dorset. Um, so we've got those three delivery models. They do vary. Um, so what Nature Space's scheme design um, uh, retains is, a, is an element of on-site um, survey and mitigation as well as off-site compensation in line with, um, with district level licensing. Um, and, but what's important to, to remember, and we, we did publish our, our framework um, in July 2019, where we set out the principles to which any scheme, regardless of the, um, any differences in design, um, all the principles to which um, each delivery model needs to adhere and, and that's the consistency. So as an example of one of the principles for every one occupied pond lost four four compensation ponds need to be need to be put in the ground. And there's backup ponds with that as well is that right? Uh, the Natural England uh, led scheme um, uses that approach yes um, um, it's, but but that's, our, that's our approach to, to creation and restoration of, of pond habitat. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not the only way. Uh, there's a question here for you, Tilly, um, from Dan Andrew, McAndrew. I wonder if the LPA might or could require mitigation for gully pots, wildlife curbs, ladders in roads close to Tilly's existing GCN ponds. Um, is that a possibility? Yeah, so um, that certainly is what's happening on that site. Um, and to be honest, they'd already designed in the road schemes where they'd crossed any kind of uh, places where newts would be moving to and from ponds. They'd already designed all those at grade with no pot drains and that kind of thing um, already before we'd gone down the district level licensing route because district level licensing didn't exist at that point in this area. And the, uh, the other thing is that there are a very small number of reptiles on site. I mean, a really small number. I think, you know, across our survey of this very big site, we ended up with about seven or something like that. But there's enough for us to say that some kind of clerk of works is going to be required um, when we're taking out particularly sensitive habitat areas. So the newts will be protected from that point of view as well. But it's almost a flip in what has happened previously, whereas previously the newt protection would have offered protection to other things that aren't necessarily covered, like for example, frogs and toads and small mammals. Now it's things like the reptiles that are going to provide a bit of a sort of surety for the newts. But certainly in terms of the scheme design, yes, the LPA can, can still condition things like, you know, at grade um, crossings and that kind of thing. And that is what's happening on that scheme. Uh, no, we stopped the poll, didn't we? If, uh, it's a question here, um, if CRAG were to define favourable conservation status for the county, how could this be formally adopted? Uh, would the district licence scheme then be expected to demonstrate how it works towards this? Um, Jen, is that, uh, well, Mike, what, what would your feelings be? What would, would we would like CRAG... to see? Um, what we were hoping would happen as part of the process was that there would be a a conservation strategy that would help work towards favourable conservation status and by no means were we expecting district level licensing to provide all of the you know provide the only mechanism for achieving favourable conservation status we would have wanted to see it work hand in hand with uh, agri-environment schemes um, other pond creation projects and why we saw it was important was that it could be used as a lever it could be used as a mechanism um, to, to, to try and leave the funds from other organisations. So there is this strategy, there is this thing that we're trying to achieve and, and you know, money from other sources could be put towards uh, creating ponds and actually achieving that favourable conservation status, not, not just using district level licensing. So that's why we, we felt it was a shame that that didn't happen. Um, there's a question here uh, for Jen uh, and any Could... Natural England comment on Mike Phillips's concerns about the scheme. I mean, how is how are the concerns? Um, you know, have things moved on, or uh, the, uh, you mentioned the framework and um, how things are 
uh, are moving on in Kent and other areas. I mean, can you make any comment on that, Jen? Yes, I can. Um, I mean, just to add to um, to Mike's thought on thoughts on favourable conservation status. So, what we, we've got an agreed um, favourable conservation status definition for at Natural England for Great Crested Newt, supported by ARC, and and that, as you know, defines the situation where when the species will be th thriving in England. We're working on the on the on the strategy now, which states the definition and the actions that we that we need to take to move towards FCS for GCN across England, um, I think, rather than, um, than, than on a local basis. Um, and, and I think DLL is, is, is a strong part of that. It's got, um, it's got a lot to offer. It's, it's part of that um, resilient landscapes and establishing bigger, better, more joined up that I think, I think we all want to see. And um, the, the focus is on the creation of pondscapes, areas with abundant ponds. And I think that's what, um, what, what DLL is all about. Um, I think it would be really good um, to, to, have a, to have a conversation with Mike um, around where we are with the Kent scheme and, and, and revisit, um, revisit your, your concerns and see if we can, see if we can sort of um, re reset and, and, um, and have a chat about that, Mike, that's, um, I think. I think we'd always be welcome, we would always welcome that approach. Great. Uh, Jen, I mean, my experience in Essex is that uh, we are now going down a site-based mitigation route and we are going to be creating uh, more ponds as well as retaining the new ponds. And I just wonder if there's any um, uh, way that that can contribute to the district licence because it's a, it's a significant large site with lots of ponds. Um, so it is a significant new Mets population. And so, um, you know, those ponds, uh, the landowner will be happy to have ponds created. It's just uh, whether that could be joined up in the site-based mitigation license that we're going to uh, apply for this winter. Um, whether that is something that, how would we go about um, those extra ponds um, and join in the district license, you know, because we will be contributing to newt conservation in that area. Jen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, we we do offer um, we, we do offer a bespoke approach for large sites um, where we'll look at the um, look at the specifics like like that and um, and see if there's a bespoke solution that we can come up with. I think the um, the, the general sort of principle applies that we're um, we're interested in putting in place. Um, off-site uh, compensation habitat that, that are in line with um, with the strategic opportunity areas and and the um, and what the model tells us about um, where to place extra habitat for for populations to thrive, um, but but sometimes there will be overlap with the strategic opportunity areas with it um, with a development site, and I think I think there are some that there is some room for discussion, but it needs to be on a site by site basis. And what's also important is that the um, that, 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 that the ponds do adhere to um, to the specification that we've um, that we've put in place for all of our creations and restorations. That um, you know that we've we've set these high standards for for our um, creations and restorations. We want that needs to be the play um, the case for any pond if we come up with a bespoke solution. Because there's an additional question here: uh, if the offsite ponds are on private land. Are there any legal mechanisms in place to retain them long term? If they were on site, there is some security through management plans that are conditioned and through section 106 agreements, et cetera. Um, any yeah, thoughts so, on that, Jen? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, I mean, in general, we we are working with with landowners that are interested in having in having ponds on their land. Um, for the for the long term and and not to um, and not to lose them at the end of the period or or indeed before it, but what we've decided to do is, as Tilly explained is that um, rather than um, if we if if we do see pond, ponds fail for whatever reason, um, then we've got um, we've got a contingency pond we've got a backup, so so in effect for every one occupied pond lost. We're putting eight in the ground because we've got the four compensation that we need to meet. 
Um, and then we've got four contingency ponds that, um, that are double up and account for any pond failure. At, at the moment, the, the failure rate is very low. Um, but I think, you know, obviously we're, we're, we are in the early stages of the scheme, so we're monitoring them um, to, to see how that changes. But, you know, we've got 100% um, um, sort of a backup as um, in, in place for each of those. So I think, I think we're covering off those, those instances where, where we may lose ponds. Um, Mike, you have a, is it a comment or a question on habitat creation? Are you mute? It's, a second, it's a secondary question really about pond creation and <clears throat> I wonder if there was a, a mechanism for ensuring that compensation ponds aren't going to be created um, on the sites where, where people were planning to, to, ponds, to, to create ponds anyway and, and district level licensing just provides a mechanism for paying for something they were already going to do, you know, particularly if it's on wildlife sites, if it's on local authority sites, they, they may have had plans to, to create ponds anyway. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, Matt, I'm not quite sure um, what, I mean, we're, we're interested in talking to, to landowners who, who do want ponds on their, on their land um, and I'm working with them over the, over the long term. So we are looking for people that, that would, like, would like to create or restore ponds. I mean, previous mitigation schemes, it's often you know, even for reptiles as well as amphibians, is when you have receptor sites and creation and stuff like that, uh, it's not actually flagged up anywhere. Um, and it's got a question here from Natalie Boots. I think that's how you say her name. Uh, will these compensation ponds be public information, such as on magic maps, so that they're not on future development land, etc.? Um, it's a similar, it's always been a, a gripe about receptor sites and creation sites. Um, they're not flagged up in planning system for whatever reason. I mean, is that something, I mean, I know the survey results and license returns um, and the risk maps are available online. Would, would these compensation pond areas be um, publicly available as well? We Hi. go on Annabelle. Hi, it's, um, it's Annabelle here. So um, when we're looking at the um, the locations that are best to um, to support the newts, obviously um, we are looking at um, avoiding areas which might be subject to future development anyway up front. So we obtain all the information that we can on future plan development in the area from local planning authorities, um, with the aim of avoiding sites which might be subject to future development. Um, and it's important that our habitat delivery bodies have a um, you know, detailed discussion with the landowners where these compensatory ponds are going to ensure that um, they are um, going to be managing the land in the long term to ensure it remains suitable for, for the newts and you know, there's no kind of plans for future development on those sites. So we are doing what we can up front to ensure that um, these ponds are going in the right places where they're likely to be secure in the long term. Um, and the, you know, the results of the monitoring and the locations where great crested newts are recorded will be made publicly available in the long term. Um, and it's going to be you know, a really valuable data set, which generates a huge amount of data nationally um, for great crested newts. Um, so I think uh, Luke and Tilly and Donna, you have uh, certificates from the district level licenses. Um, what's your sort of advice on reasonable you know re what would you do if you had a site um which uh you've got a district level license and you have reptiles and you know you find in newts but you know what would you uh, as a consultant advise your clients in terms of uh you know i know i understand that um some cases that clients are reluctant to do extra stuff i mean it's leading on to a poll in a bit um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Tilly? Um, so uh, one of my sites definitely has got reptiles as well. And I think, you know, you've got the legal mechanisms that protect reptiles to cover you there. You know, they've got to be doing clerk of works. There's got to be some kind of oversight of the um, habitat strip when it happens. You know, if required, you would still have to do a reptile trap and translocate if it was that kind of a site. Um, which would mean that under your district level license, any newts that you also find, you can move out of the way and, you know, you can do that. 
much more easily and with sort of well it's much more easy to get the license for the newts doing it that with the district level licensing way and in actual fact i think i'd be less concerned about the newts on a site where i had something like reptiles because i think that provides the um the real lever that you need to get your developer to do reasonable avoidance measures it's the sites where you haven't got anything else that i think it then becomes a bit more of a thorny issue i don't know what the others think about that Anyone else, Donna? How, how, what's, what happened with your site? Um, well, with our site, we already had the fencing up in advance under the other license that protected any reptiles from actually coming onto our construction area. So, yeah, really, I think I don't think there's really anything that I would add to Tilly's. You know, the the type of mitigation that you provide would depend on the size of the population, the type of habitat that you've got on there. But yeah, essentially, you would still be undertaking that mitigation and still potentially putting in fencing as well in some areas as well. So that's why for us, where you've got reptiles on site, you're not necessarily saving. Um, the costs that sometimes would be provided as a result of district level licensing. Uh, Luke, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so at our site, we um, we didn't do reptile surveys. The, the habitat was generally not very suitable for them. Large areas of arable land, there was some field margins that were suitable. Uh, so actually our ecological park works on site under a precaution method of working was already doing hand searches for reptiles, which also allowed there to be no extra cost for looking for GCN at the same time because generally they will use similar habitats. Um, like Tilly was saying, if, you, if you've if you not got measures in place to look for other species, especially species such as reptiles, it, it, you know, it's, it's probably a case of convincing your client to, to take on the RAMS reasonable avoidance measures to look just for GCN. They might be inclined not to if they don't need to. Um, so it, it's it's good to engage your clients at an early early stage really and just just see what they want to do and what they're willing to do. But certainly having other protected species on site can be very beneficial for the newts. Now it's very interesting to hear that because previous licenses, newt mitigation licenses I've had, I've used the presence of newts to protect reptiles because they're partially protected. Uh, hibernation banks with adders in them um you're less likely to get them recreated um but i found great crested newts in them using a terrestrial survey so i put that into a license to recreate that bank uh, which will benefit adders and it looks like now if you're going down a dll route um the reptiles may protect individual newts um because you have to take reasonable avoidance measures to not kill or injure uh, the widespread reptiles um so with a DLL, if you find newts, you can relocate them within a certain distance um, into suitable habitat. Um, so it looks like reptiles potentially could be, if you're going down a DLL route, um, could help to protect individual newts. Um, and uh, you can probably retain habitat on site for reptiles as well. So these, these questions, uh, we're gonna collate all these and we're gonna group them into themes um, and we've got a whole host of uh, questions that we could get answered and send out to um, people that have answered them. Um, and uh, where else have we got here? So more risk maps, there's just so many. Any more on the chat? Uh, so Duncan Brown says, my experience has been where clients perceive the cost of DLO are high. Um, and it's gone they are willing to pay reduced risk delays as they are less likely to instruct the optional ECAL because of perceived unnecessary cost. As the higher DLL costs are the ones with the higher impacts, they're the ones I would like to ensure that e that ECAL is undertaken. So that's sort of a, a comment. Um, yeah, Tilly, you can jump in. Um, so on Duncan's point where the clients perceive that the costs of district level licensing are high um, and they're less likely to instruct the optional ecological clerk of works, the local planning authorities are still able to condition things that you have put in your reports, for example, in your, um, if it needs an ecological impact assessment or a, just a preliminary ecological appraisal that covers um, 
you know, a, a sort of low, low level impact assessment rather than the full document if it's a smaller site. And they will still condition things like that. So they'll condition things like, you know, the measures outlined in the ecological impact assessment, for example. And so I often will put things in there that aren't necessarily going to get covered under a license because then the LPA can condition that. And if you've gone through that with your client in advance, that is another mechanism to secure things like the ecological clerk of works. Um, so just because things don't have to be done under a license, that doesn't mean you there aren't other mechanisms for getting them included. Uh, Donna, what what do you think about that? Is that? Yeah, I don't I don't really think I've got anything to add on that. I mean, our client was ours was quite a significant cost, and our client were happy to uh, pay for that additional ecological supervision. So I think much of it really just depends on your client, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a comment there by Brett Lewis. Um, and we've got, we've got five minutes, but um, Jen, if you're, uh, there's a question. What length of time do Natural England consider long-term management of these ponds to be? Does it align with the definition of in perpetuity for biodiversity net gain, i.e. 30 years? Should these ponds have conservation covenants? Uh, this would seem sensible as though the current landowner is in favour of ponds. If the land is sold, the next landowner may not be. Have you got an um, answer to that, Jen? Uh, yeah, so so at the moment, the, um, the the definition of sort of in perpetuity that, that we're using for district level licensing is, is 25 years. Um, but but that said, I would say that we we are we are working with landowners that are interested in in ponds for for longer term than that. We can't um, we can't prevent land being sold um, to landowners that might might not um, be so be so minded about that pond. But that's where the um, the doubling up comes in. So I just I'd just say eight ponds instead of four. That's that's the approach that we're taking um, to to mitigate for any losses and failures. So okay. Um, anything more? Uh, if monitoring shows the scheme isn't as successful as imagined, would Nat would Natural England consider enhancing terrestrial land as part of DLL? Yes, I think we we um, we we are always looking at um, evolving the scheme and continuously improving it. We we're still at the early stages and only just starting to get um, get that monitor those monitoring results in. But we will um, if we're in a position where um, there's there's too many ponds in the landscape. That that sounds to me like a good a good position to be in, um, and and we will definitely consider terrestrial habitat in the future. Okay, uh, so we're coming towards the end, really. Is there anything more to add um, around the panel, um, Luke? Anything more, would you? No, I have, I have nothing really more to add, but I, I have always thought with the DLL scheme, it, it is focused generally on ponds, and, and I think going forward, taking more account of terrestrial habitats, because you are losing terrestrial habitats on your site, and you're compensating with aquatic habitats a lot of the time. I think... That, that's something that seriously needs considering going forward because you could have all these ponds and then these might not have any terrestrial habitats suitable to go in. Uh, uh, Donna, that's something uh, that's always been on my mind. Sorry, Luke. Uh, Donna, anything more to add? Uh, yeah, that's actually really interesting that Luke said that because that's exactly the same thought that has been going through my head as we've been listening to this. And I think it just would be really interesting. So it's great to hear that that's something that could come into play, Jen, in, in the future. And um, it'd just be interesting, I guess, from your perspective and maybe feeding back to our perspective, if, if the, the licenses that are being applied for actually are resulting in predominantly terrestrial habitat loss as, as, or, you know, as a, rather than actual pond loss. So, yeah, it's good to hear that that's being considered in the future. Uh, Tilly? I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with that because on both of my sites, it's been terrestrial habitat that's been impacted and not actually ponds. And in fact, on my big site, you know, there were already 16 ponds within 250 metres of each other. More ponds wasn't really, I don't think, what was required in that area necessarily. Um, and I'm really interested to see the results of the poll that say that people overwhelmingly pretty much think that the reasonable avoidance measures should be mandatory rather than um, optional for the clients. 
Yeah, yeah, I have, uh, I have shared that, haven't I? Um, Mike, have you got any? Um, what what could ARGs do and volunteer surveyors and you know how best would we realign ourselves with with uh, uh, monitoring this sort of thing? Okay, it's a good question. Um, advice for other ARGs where there's a district level licensing coming would be to just try and keep the, the focus on, on newts and try and keep the focus on, on what's favourable conservation status for newts and, and how can that best be achieved. And that's looking at not just number of ponds, it's looking at the range of the species, it's looking at you know, how can you uh, look at the, the range, the population and the amount of habitat. And that's, that's, the, that's, I think, is where we need to focus our efforts and district level licensing in general. And, and for ARGs, um, be prepared for a bumpy ride, I suppose. Oh, it can't be that bad. <laughs> uh, well, we come come to the end now. Uh, there's a comment still coming in and stuff, and um, we're going to be collating these and hopefully get some answers to them. Um, and uh, we'll be posting them out. Um, Angie, are you there? I am there. So what I'm going to say is, um, uh, I'm slightly mindful of um, data protection law, but. I'm assuming everybody that signed up for this seminar would like to hear um, the answers to the questions and some of the chat. So we will send the appropriate questions to the appropriate people, which could be Nature Space as well as Natural England. Uh, I know we've invited, well, we've invited Natural England to join us on the panel. That didn't mean we weren't inviting Nature Space or Warwickshire or Dorset or Rekin and Telford. It's just um, basically- Only got our hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, in an hour and a half. Uh, it may be we then run another one of these sessions next spring, um, if there's an appetite for it, and then we can invite other uh, providers along. So big thank you to all the panellists, everybody that's joined us. It's uh, fantastic to have so much interest in this. And in, it is a work in progress, so I think um, I think it's important that Natural England, Nature Space and the other providers are here to hear what people think and that hopefully the process can evolve to benefit the newts and all the other creatures as well. I'll just share my end screen now and say thank you to everyone and good night. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.